Yeah. Okay, so our next speaker is Ted Southern, right? Yeah. Yep, the uh, founder of uh, Final Frontier Design. This is a good segue. He's among the, he's gonna talk to us about how, uh, um, once we get the glitches fixed, he'll be talking about his company and how startups interface with NASA. Okay. So the last question, I just wanted to touch on that for a second about thermal issues and the mechanical counterpressure is actually a really interesting one right now with uh, gas gas filled balloons that are spacesuits. Uh, thermal uh, control is really difficult and people actually wear liquid cooling garments inside the spacesuit in order to keep their body uh, regulated. And uh, with the possibility of a mechanical counterpressure suit, you, you wouldn't necessarily need a liquid cooling garment with a mechanical counterpressure suit. Your body uh, can be exposed directly to the vacuum. <clears throat> you could cool via sweat, and if you needed to warm up, you could put on an extra layer just to make sure you stay warm. But uh, cooling would, would be greatly simplified by mechanical counterpressure. Um, I'm here to talk a bit, oh man, this is all, all bad. <clears throat> I'm here to talk a, a little bit about working with NASA. <clears throat> and I saw that last couple presentations talked a lot, of, a lot about that also. So I'm gonna um, skip quickly through uh, my background and uh, and explain to you why uh, I think it's uh, important that, that I'm here and, I, and explain to you why it's important that we're doing what we're doing here. Um, I am the president and co-founder of Final Frontier Design. We're um, a small business operating out of the, out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, I'm partnered with a man named Nikolai Moisiev. He worked at Zvezda, the Russian spacesuit manufacturer, for about 20 years. Um, I have a background in uh, costumes and props. Um, we currently have four full-time employees out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and uh, the reason that I'm here today is because I am a winner of NASA's Centennial Challenge back in 2009, this, the astronaut glove competition. Uh, our company has had three SBIR awards through NASA, and we're currently under a Space Act agreement with NASA to, to qualify our suit for orbital spaceflight. Uh, so my partner's background, he uh, grew up in the Soviet Union, uh, he got his degree in aerospace engineering from the Moscow Aviation Institute in 1986. Uh, and he went to Zvezda straight out of the, uh, the Moscow A Aviation Institute. Uh, really sort of the classic background of an engineer going directly into a governmental space program. Uh, his, he likes to say his first gloves in space were in 1988. So he has, he has a long history of uh, spacesuit design. Um, and I, I love the mustache. Um, <laughs> he ended up leaving Zvezda in 2006, uh, specifically with the interest of uh, exploring commercial space. And uh, he and his partners, Gary Harris and Pablo de Leon, entered NASA's first astronaut glove competition in 2007. Uh, and you can see some pictures of them there. Uh, my background is in costumes and props. Uh, you can see all kinds of various things. I'll just flip through here. I have built a lot of Victoria's Secret wings. Um, I ended up going to graduate school. Specifically, uh, I, I had a, a big interest in hands. Hands are just fascinating to me. It's sort of what makes us human. Um, it's how we interface with the world. Um, there are theories that uh, our hand development, the ability to, to perfectly oppose our fingers, drove speech in our cerebral cortex. And that ended up being my sort of entire graduate school project was uh, developing ways to work with hands. This is all, these are all shots from my uh, thesis show. And uh, I actually also entered into the 2007 astronaut glove competition, specifically from this angle of an artist working with hands. Uh, you can see NASA's current glove there on the left. Uh, Nick's glove just to the right of it, my glove third, and then Peter Homer's glove is fourth there uh, in, in that lineup, not necessarily best to least. Um, Nick and I ended up joining forces in 2009. He and I were competitors in 2007 for that first glove competition, which was specifically for the pressure garment. 2009, they asked to build both the pressure garment and the outer garment, the TMG, the thermal micrometeoroid garment. And um, we were excited to win $100,000 from NASA. We won second place in that competition by outperforming NASA's current technology. Uh, you can see on the left here, one of ILC Dover's representatives, their suit technician, is testing our glove for wrist ad abduction. He's got a, a force gauge that measures just how much force it takes to ad abduct the wrist. And then on the right, the glove is actually filled with water, you can't tell there, and they're inflating it until it bursts. 
so these are just a couple of the uh, challenges that we had to go through in order to outperform NASA's current technology. And, uh, you know, that's, that could have been the end of the story. And I think that's really where this uh, starts to get interesting, is that NASA could have j just said, here's your money, congratulations, we'll talk to you later. But they actually showed us a lot of support. They invited us to headquarters uh, just a couple months later, and we met quite a few other Centennial Challenge winners. Uh, this is us meeting um, the, the administrator, Charlie Bolden, and, uh, and getting at the award ceremony there. And they also invited us to the Johnson Space Center in Houston to uh, meet some of the spacesuit engineers and show them our technology. Um, at that point, I think it was May 2010, that we went to JSC. Um, we decided to, s to form a business to actually uh, move forward with this and use the, the prize money as seed money to, 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 uh, to found Final Frontier Design. And uh, at that point, we applied for our first SBIR. And SBIR is the Small Business Innovation Research Award. Um, and uh, we were uh, mercifully awarded an SBIR in 2011 for glove development. Um, at the same time, uh, with Nick's background, we pretty quickly decided to go from just the glove to the whole suit. Um, and uh, that would have been a big jump for me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really grateful for working with Nick because he has a lot of uh, experience. Um, but uh, we, we decided pretty quickly that that was something that we could do and we did do. Um, at that point, I also had a, um, a residency at iBeam here in Manhattan. And uh, I'd like to um, give a shout out to them because they showed us a lot of support. Um, we also found out pretty quickly that Nikolai was a foreign national from Russia and spacesuits at that point were considered weapons by the U.S. Department of State, categorized under the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR. So we pretty quickly had to get some licenses in place and start logging our emails, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Sure, please. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but I have to run out, and I just really wanted to be here at the end of your thing. But um, I've actually been telling stories all, you know, for months about you, mm -hmm. in that I now work in the office of the uh, chief technologist who was negotiating, you know, some of these prizes. And when I asked for examples, I had to go speak at Columbia Business School, and I asked people to give me examples of innovation and how we, you know, how we learned from it and how we were doing it. And some of the challenges that you are mentioning are things that we took quite seriously. Like we, we, you know, gave a prize and said, "Hey, what about this cool thing?" And then we couldn't buy it ourselves, you know. And and so how to get how to get through some of those um, wickets are are lessons that we were learning with you. But this is certainly one of the stories that NASA celebrates and that I think really speaks to people. And that's why I like to use it is that, you know, somebody looking at something from a different point of view really brought something to the table for all of us. And so I just wanted to say thanks before I had to run. Thank you. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice yeah. to meet you, too. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I do appreciate that point that, uh, you know, I, I am partnered with an engineer who has a, a deep background in, in uh, space travel, but I am an artist, and uh, I think that it's, it is a sort of mutual collaboration between the two of us. It's not just Nick designing the suits. It's sort of both of us coming up with new ideas. And... Um, I am grateful for NASA's uh, a bit flexibility. Um, I have served as the principal investigator for all three of the SBIRs, and I have an MFA in sculpture. So I think that is saying something to, Na to NASA's you know, flexibility in terms of who they'll award contracts to. Um, I'm just gonna go quickly through sort of our background, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about actually working with NASA. So uh, 2013, 2014, we had two more SBIRs from NASA, one for uh, elbow and shoulder uh, inflated assembly, and another one for radiation protection for spacesuits. Um, we also built our third generation spacesuit, and I'll show you a couple pictures of that, and got through some flight testing. Um, Via those SBIRs, we did a lot of cycling, a lot of engineering uh, to make sure that our concepts for the suit worked. Um, and uh, just as a quick background, our concept for the 2009 astronaut glove competition was to employ a single layer pressure garment. That's uh, different than what NASA generally uses. They normally have a double layer pressure garment, which has a sewn external restraint and an internal gas bladder. And what we've done, not just with the glove, but also with the suit, is to sort of combine both the, the bladder and the restraint. Uh, here's a quick breakdown of our current sp space suit. Um, I won't go through all the uh, individual components there, but this is really 
uh, at this point, our cornerstone as a company, not the government contracting necessarily, but the um, commercial capabilities of an IVA spacesuit. You can see we've done some flight testing with this. This is actually a simulator, but we've also been in, in aircraft with pilots flying our with our suit pressurized. Um, 2015, we have some upcoming contracts this month, and uh, we are currently under a Space Act agreement with NASA uh, to develop our suit for orbital space flight. Um, we've had some commercial partners, and uh, we're also moving towards commercial products. So uh, um, making a spacesuit is cool and all that, but it's really hard to find people who want to spend $65,000 on a spacesuit, even though that's about a quarter of what NASA currently spends. And uh, one of our biggest challenges over the last couple of years has been to find a commercial voice terrestrially with people here on Earth. Um, and uh, we're excited about some upcoming products that will be uh, sort of spin-offs related to the spacesuit, but useful for everybody. So with that background, uh, I hope that it's uh, more relevant why I'm speaking to a, a group today. And uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about working with NASA in general. We, we had some panels up here earlier that, that spoke a little bit about some opportunities. Um, but uh, sort of fundamentally, NASA is really complex. NASA, there's about 17,000 people who work for NASA, $18 billion budget, and uh, more research facilities than I could name off the top of my head. Um, and there are equally that many opportunities to work with them. Um, they're, um, they are a government organization, and so one of the uh, good parts about that is they're by mandate meant to be transparent. Uh, almost all of their contracts are um, listed online and uh, openly available for people to compete for. Um, however, they are a major bureaucracy, and uh, part of working with NASA is uh, trying to understand and work within that bureaucracy. Um, and I would like to say, I, I sort of mentioned this before, but I, I really do believe that they're, they're trying to enable commercial space. They're trying to be nimble. They're trying to change. They're trying to move beyond the standard cost plus contracting. And, and uh, it's a big, um, uh, I, I'm really impressed by, by NASA's ability to, to sort of change and, and move forward that way. Uh, this is just a quick uh, outline of some different facilities that uh, we've had some interface with. Um, the Johnson Space Center is perhaps the most famous NASA facility. Maybe the Kennedy Space Center is right up there, but um, that's the J JSC, the Johnson Space Center, has really been our main interface because they like to consider themselves manned space flight. So if you're working with spacesuits, almost all of the work for spacesuits happens through JSC. Uh, the Kennedy Space Center is a very exciting place to go visit, and there's a lot happening there, uh, and they are actively working towards turning into a commercial launch complex. It's a really exciting transformation that's happening at, K at KSC as well. Um, and I'm sure you guys recognize uh, JPL, the Marshall facility down in Huntsville where Space Camp happens, but also a lot of other cool things happen. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting to note that there is some competition between these facilities. Different, uh, different areas want to all, you know, everybody wants to work on manned space flight. So for instance, the Marshall Space Flight Center has a neutral buoyancy lab. It's no longer in use, but uh, th that was sort of a big uh, competition between JSC and Marshall. Um, and uh, I think there is some opportunity with people like us to get into NASA by sort of employing that competition between, between facilities. Um, this is a quick list of uh, the ways I could think of to work with NASA, and I'm sure there are a bunch more. Um, a lot of these are acronyms, and I'll show you at the end, I have an acronymic map in order to work with NASA. There's, it's a very complicated uh, organization. Um, that first one on top is a really interesting one, NASA's Acquisition Internet Service, or NAIS. That lists essentially every contract NASA puts out publicly. That means, you know, janitorial work or working with liquid hydrogen or uh, requests for proposals for any variety of, of uh, new contracts coming out. And um, it's sort of up to the company, up to the provider to, to troll through that and find uh, relevant uh, calls, relevant listings for, for people, but it is a very valuable resource for, for companies interested in working with NASA. 
Um, I've mentioned the small business innovation research contracts. These are not just within NASA, but they're, they're full governmental um, calls. So the DOD does SBIRs, um, the NSF does SBIRs. There's quite a, quite a few different um, governmental organizations that do SBIRs and STTRs, which are technology transfer um, that has more to do with universities than particularly with businesses. Um, those work in a really interesting way. Every year, these um, governmental organizations have a call, and uh, they'll have some specific topics that they're interested in exploring. NASA will have um, maybe seven different categories and probably 100, 150 different topics that they're interested in people having uh, uh, calls for. And um, NASA's uh, most recent call ended uh, January 28th, so um, th that won't happen again for another year, but it, it is a very interesting way to interface with NASA and certainly probably why I uh, exist as a company. Those SBIRs have been really valuable. Um, requests for proposals, those are generally listed under the NAIS, but it is a very interesting way of working with NASA directly. And then just a couple of different ones. I saw CASIS. CASIS didn't make it up here, but we heard from the people from CASIS earlier. Um, ROSES is probably my favorite acronym that NASA has, the Research Opportunities in Space and Earth Sciences. It's just so poetic, but it is a, a very uh, a good way to work with NASA. They also have flight opportunities programs where if you have a payload that you want to uh, test uh, in, in microgravity, you can actually test that through the flight opportunities program. There are space act agreements to work with NASA. Uh, I'm used to the centennial challenges. That's how I got started. But I think a lot of that is now sort of coordinated under SOLVE. Uh, and NASA also uh, accepts unsolicited proposals. They probably don't like to talk about that too much. But you can come to NASA and say, hey, you don't know a lot about, uh, for instance, capsule landings. I think this happened recently where um, a, a company challenged NASA on their ability to model uh, the G-forces um, induced from capsule landings, because they haven't done any research on that since Apollo. Um, and uh, they, I know they were sort of scrambling to find some answers to that unsolicited proposal. Um, I will say, if you're interested in working with NASA, bureaucrat beware. You, there are a lot of um, uh, things to know and things to learn about with NASA. I mentioned briefly the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. But a lot of uh, space is still sort of categorized under military. And that means that uh, you need to work almost exclusively with US citizens or US persons. Uh, and you need to be very aware of uh, how you're categorized. It's interesting that NASA, although it is part of the US government, is not the regulatory organization for ITAR. And uh, sometimes NASA is in violation of ITAR themselves and are not necessarily the people to consult with when you're dealing with ITAR. Um, things like cash versus accrual-based accounting was something that I didn't know anything about as a costumer, but uh, that starts to become really important when you're actually contracting with NASA. Um, it's uh, important to think about how you qualify under a lot of these different um, government contracts. There are certain things like hub zones or minority-owned businesses, female-owned businesses that can actually help you qualify for contracts uh, above and beyond uh, your proposal. Um, there's a lot of questions about how you deal with patents, how you deal with trade secrets, and what you choose to have open sourced. Um, human testing is a challenge. I, um, I've had to go through several IRBs, inst inst Institutional Review Boards, in order to qualify for human testing. Um, and uh, of course, you have to cover yourself with liability and indemnification. So there's, there's a lot of issues that you start to get in the deeper that you get into the bureaucracy with NASA, but, um, but it is exciting and it is worthwhile. Um, and I, I will say before I go on to my acronymic map and kind of wrap, wrap this up that um, it, it's a great opportunity, but um, almost all of these contracts are trying to gear you up and move you towards some commercialization. Uh, NASA is interested in developing technologies so that you can help the rest of the world, not just for space travel, but also for you know, Earth's problems. We've got plenty of problems here terrestrially, and um, I think it's really important as you're uh, thinking about working with NASA, how are you going to move beyond NASA? How are you going to sort of uh, help the rest of the world when, when these problems happen? So, and uh, to close up, this is my 
I, I haven't updated this in a while, but this is sort of how I started mapping out working with NASA, and it gets more and more complicated the deeper you get into it, but uh, they love acronyms, and so I would get very used to that. Okay, do you, are there any questions for? Great. Any uh, any questions for Ted Ted in the front? Oh, let's start with you. So you mentioned all the tools uh, or or various acronyms uh, that you use to get w work through NASA. Are there any uh, improvements? Room for improvement? You see that that you know uh, an individual could contribute somehow to improving the user interface or just the way NASA proposes or uh, exposes their RFPs. Yeah, um, <clears throat> NAIS is their main interface for exposing RFPs, and um, from my experience, you essentially have to troll through it yourself. If there was, uh, there there are ways to search. Uh, they're generally by by research center, so you can pick. Oh, okay, I want to just look at what JSC is looking for under NAIS. Um, but I don't want to be limited just to the Johnson Space Center personally. I'd like to look at you know what Glenn is interested in as well and what Marshall is interested in. Um, so um, having ways to search through that where you aren't looking, you know, you don't have to weed through the um, janitorial service contracts or um, or or you know what things that are less relevant. That would be really useful, and uh, I'm not really sure how that would happen. I think that would have to happen internally with NASA, but there may be a way to troll through calls and listings. Tags, sure, yeah, tags would be very useful for NAIS. So something like a web crawler that indexes all the new postings and puts a nice API on it, adds alerts, things like that would be useful for you and probably any other government contractor? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that'd be useful for a lot of government agencies. Yeah, yeah. The APIs aren't the best, but uh, did you have a question? So, uh, I think the question is, could you please elaborate, elaborate on your business model and uh, also discuss to what extent the emergence of companies, space flight commercial companies like Virgin Galactic are opening up opportunities for, for yourself? Sure, sure. So um, our business model started uh, as an accident. We'd, I never meant to start a spacesuit company. Um, essentially, we won this astronaut glove competition. NASA said, you should apply for this SBIR. If NASA says to do that, I will, right? Um, and uh, that is sort of how we got started. Um, after a couple rounds of government contracting, we started to learn some lessons about how government contracting works. It's essentially on and off, right? And it's not, a, not the best way to start a business. Um, it's certainly a, a great way to maintain a business, and uh, I, uh, I am you know, proud and, and grateful for the, the financial support that NASA has shown. But uh, in the end, a business needs to make money um, regularly. And uh, government contracts uh, aren't dependable, aren't reliable, are sort of cyclical. And uh, so over the years, our, our business model has changed from being exclusively government oriented to finding commercial opportunities based on spin-offs from our work with the spacesuit. So we're sort of using our spacesuit as a centerpiece of the company and then finding ways that the technology that we've developed, the patterning that we've developed, uh, can be useful for people here on Earth. So in, for instance, we're looking at firemen's gloves, we're looking at um, military gloves, uh, but we're also, actually this summer, I think we're gonna come out with a Kickstarter campaign for a uh, technical jacket, like a shell, uh, for wintertime use that will have um, fabric technologies and uh, insulation technologies that we found sort of exclusively in the suit that we want to bring to to people um, here on Earth. So uh, that's been sort of the focus of our business plan is finding the the spin-off, finding the commercialization out of that. Um, the space suit, as opposed to the government contracts, is also a commercialization attempt uh, by Final Frontier Design. We haven't had any government funding specifically to develop an IVA spacesuit. We've done that all sort of on our own. 
And um, the purpose of developing an IVA spacesuit is for these new companies like Virgin Galactic, like x like SpaceX, uh, because they're all going to need some pressure garment. Virgin uh, doesn't think they're going to need a pressure garment, but um, we'll see how that actually plays out. Um, uh, and it's a big opportunity. We've, we've responded to some RFPs from SpaceX. We've uh, certainly entertained quite a bit of um, interest from, from several different commercial space companies. And in fact, we're partnered with several as well. Our first spacesuit sale was for a high altitude balloon company in Spain called Zero to Infinity. Uh, we're working with uh, Starfighters Aerospace out of the Kennedy Space Center. They fly F-104 Starfighters. Um, out of the shuttle landing facility, and uh, we're actually working on integration of our suit with the F-104s. Um, and there's a variety of other um, high-altitude companies, not just rocket companies, but uh, companies that want to fly above 55 or 60,000 feet that actually need pressure garments. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a big opportunity, but the, that sector um, is still trying to find its own voice and still sort of in an inchoate developing stage. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of R&D funding to, you know, to, to develop spacesuits at the same time. And I think that that's going to be um, kind of an afterthought. You know, once Virgin starts flying, they're going to say, oh, okay, actually, we need pressure garments to get up there. Does anybody have something? And, and here we'll be. So. Okay, great. Let's thank Ted one more time. <laughs>